Please welcome Dr. Troy Rowan. Thanks, Dare. Well, a, a big thanks to Dare and to, to Gordon and everybody for having me up. I, I think a lot of, of Gordon especially. I, got, I came to Tennessee right at two years ago, almost to the day, and one of the first phone calls that I got when I moved here um, is from Gordon Jones. And Gordon and I talk probably monthly, if not more frequently, and I've never met a person that has, has pushed me more intellectually about the beef industry than Gordon has. And, and I think that, that this lectureship and this event um, is really a testament to Gordon's passion for the beef industry in, in Tennessee and Kentucky. I don't know if there's a person that's, that's more invested in our two states um, being efficient, successful, and profitable in the beef world. Um, so it's a, a huge honor for me to come here and, and I thank Gordon um, for all that he's done since I got here. And the, the other big honor for me today um, is, is to be able to, for the first time ever, speak um, at an event with my former PhD advisor who's, who's going to be on the stage right after me. Um, Jared Decker is, is a really, really um, just a, a huge piece of our, our beef industry here in the southeast in the fescue belt. Um, so I'm, I'm really tickled to get to, to share some of my work um, here and then, and then listen to Jared and, and, and sharing this experience with him. But so before I start in here, Gordon's prompt for me was breeding a more efficient and profitable commercial female. And I think that in, in today's world, we, we hear these words a lot, right? Um, sustainability is, is a big one, right? There is a pressure from our consumers to be more sustainable beef producers. And, and to me, I think that sometimes that gets our heckles up as beef producers, right? Um, what does sustainability mean? And how does that affect our ability to be profitable? And, and the really encouraging thing to me, the more that we dig into this, the more that we crunch the numbers, right? We have our, our friends in the ag econ departments that tell us this. These things can go hand in hand, right? We can be more sustainable, and by being more sustainable, we can be more efficient, and by being more efficient, we're gonna be more profitable, right? These things aren't working against each other, they're working in concert with one another, and I think that that's, that's really, really exciting. So as I get started, I think it's really important that we think about what we're, what we're doing, right? And I hear a lot about plant-based protein, um, and this is what I always think of, right? This is plant-based, sustainable protein that we've been raising for thousands of years, right? We are, we are stewards of the land, we are stewards of our animals, and we are able um, to improve these animals. We've been doing that, and we're doing it at a faster rate than we ever have been right now. So we can make these animals more efficient, we can make them more sustainable, and I think that beef is gonna play a major role in feeding this growing world population that we talk about all the time. So, uh, and, and people show you this all the time as well, right? This is over time, whoops, hit the wrong button. From 1970, right, we're, we're producing about the same amount of beef, we're doing it with less cows. And the way that we do that, I think, is um, it's sort of multifaceted, right? Uh, and it's, it's beyond just this, this raw productivity. And, and when, I, when I came to Tennessee, one of the challenges that I saw in our beef industry is that we're very, very good at selecting for this end of the year revenue, right? This is a concrete thing. We get a check from a sale facility at the end of the year when we market our calves, and that's easy for us to visualize. We can quantify this revenue really, really well. But the, the issue and the thing that I think comes down to this is efficiency question in a really big way is what about all these things, right? Do we have an understanding of our costs? And do we have an understanding of how we can breed our cattle um, to lower these costs, right? Um, and and w without sort of sacrificing this revenue to make ourselves more profitable, right? I'm not an ag economist, but this profit equation is pretty straightforward. You gotta subtract these from these before you can know if you're profitable, right? And so I think that, that my talk today is gonna walk through a whole bunch of different ways that we're able to select for traits that both balance that revenue, we're making money, but also they reduce our costs, they make those cows more efficient and more sustainable along the way. And so which traits matter to our bottom line? This is a, a slide that I stole from, from my advisor, Jared Decker, and his thing is always, if we're, we're gonna select for one trait, that single trait that we're selecting for should always be profitability, right? And like I said, there's two, two pieces of profitability. We have to generate revenue, um, for us in Kentucky and Tennessee, this is typically weaned calf weight, right? Not a lot of us are, are retaining ownership um, of these animals, right? So, so being able to get a live calf and weaned pounds is, is gonna be our main driver of revenue. But you have to keep in mind all of us that keep commercial females around, and that's the whole topic of my, of my discussion this morning, 
is what do we do about all of these, these traits that make our commercial females more or less profitable? And so when we start to, to dig into all that, uh, I think that it's important for us to first contextualize what our limiting factors are. And uh, I think that as I, as I started in this industry, right, the cow herd size was always the, the main driver, right? How many cows do we have, right? And I, I think that I've shifted a little bit in my understanding of what our limiting factor is, right? It's not just a matter of how many cows we have um, and how many wean pounds they, they produce at the end of the year or, or red meat at the end of the year if we're retaining ownership and, and selling on a grid, right? The real limiting factor are our forage resources. And I think when we take a step back and see that is what limits us, right? we start to build a cow herd that fits this environment, that fits this, um, this sort of limitation on us. And I, I throw this up for a reason. This is our Middle Tennessee Ag Research Station, um, just south of Nashville, about 45 minutes in Spring Hill. And, and I throw that up here because this is, we're truly um, being pushed at this station to do more with less, right? So I, I drew a little red border around it. And what you'll see up here, um, what you don't see up here, is this is a subdivision, this is a subdivision, this is a subdivision. On the south border, there's a subdivision. On the, on the west border here, there's a 200 acre battery plant, right? We are, we're getting squeezed here, and, and this is not gonna get any better for us, right? So our, our big goal here, right, is how do we demonstrate, how do we, how do we effectively produce um, as much of this end product in as efficient, sustainable way as possible under these constraints, right? This forage base can support a certain number of cows, right? But can we make those cows more efficient at utilizing those resources, turning them into wean calf pounds in, in dollars at the end of the year? And so when we start to think about all the things that make this cow profitable and sustainable, right? Um, I think that it all comes down to the title of this conference, right? A profitable cow is an efficient cow. And there are a dozen different ways that a cow can be efficient or inefficient, right? And, and I'll sort of walk through all these and, and hopefully tie this together by the end of the presentation. But the, the one that we think of in efficiency, we talk a lot in the beef industry about feed efficiency, right? How is an animal able to convert pounds of feed into pounds of gain, right? And there's, there's something very similar for this cow, right? She's not eating a, a concentrate feed in a feedlot, but she, she has some sort of underlying forage intake, and we have to have that for her and able to perform her basic biological functions. She has to live, um, she has to breed, and she has to support a calf. But all of these other pieces that fall in under efficiency, um, moderate mature cow size is a trait that we measure. Um, as sort of an indicator for this piece of, of maintenance requirements or, or what a cow is going to need to eat um, in order to go out and perform. Milk is another big one, right? That's, that's how we add weaning pounds to this calf. He has some genetic potential that he inherits um, from both of his parents to grow, but he has got to have milk in order for that to be realized, right? So that's a, a piece of this maternal and efficient cow. There's been some really, really good work here at the University of Kentucky that says, hey, maybe we need to think more about milk as a, a, a thing that's best in moderation, right? Um, maybe having more milk is actually gonna drive this thing up, right? This maintenance requirement that a cow needs, if she's a really, really heavy milker, she's gonna eat more, right? If she's a big, mature cow, she's gonna eat more. So we start to see all of these things that are entangled together. Um, they drive each other in, in different and opposite, sometimes favorable and sometimes unfavorable ways. The other big piece of efficiency that, that doesn't fit nicely under this umbrella of, of sort of feed efficiency or, or I guess metabolism or whatever is, is fertility, right? And fertility I think is probably our biggest driver of, of efficiency in a commercial cow-calf herd. Um, this is a quote, I wish I could attribute it to the first person that I heard it from, but the return on investment of an open cow is depressingly low. And, and I don't think there's, there's anything more true than that, right? Because when we think about what, what this picture of efficiency looks like, if we're going you know, input, forage input to calf output, um, when calf output is zero, that cow is, is really um, whittling away at our, at our overall herd's efficiency, right? Developing heifers, right? Even if we're culling these cows that come up as open, that heifer that we have to develop, we're putting resources into her, both financially um, and some of our forage resources into that developing heifer who's not gonna give us a calf until she's two years old, right? So this fertility piece is really, really important. And, and what comes from that are a bunch of these other traits that we, we sort of piece together and uh, cow longevity. And so having a cow that's able to stay in the herd 
um, and, and earn her, earn the investment that we've made in her, right? My econ colleagues say that that's uh, about six years that it takes for a commercial female um, to make herself profitable, right? She can't miss a calf, but if, she's, if she gets to six, only then does she start to be in the black, right? If we're missing calves, if we're culling that cow before she's had that fifth calf, um, all of a sudden we're, we're in the red with this cow. We're losing money and it takes a really long time. I think missing one calf, a cow has to stick around until she's 11, until she gets back into the green. So all of these reasons that we might cull a cow early, um, fertility being number one, but not forgetting about structural soundness. If she can't get around, she um, is getting cold. That cow is less efficient. Utter structure, all of these things that we could cull a cow for um, are pieces of the efficiency picture. And then one of the other things that I think is, is worth mentioning um, is this idea of emissions, right? There, there is a pressure on us um, from our consumer, from our government, um, to, to be conscientious of this emissions piece. And I'll, I'll share some data at the end of this that suggests that this is another thing that we're, we're not working in opposite directions on, right? A more efficient cow is gonna emit less greenhouse gases. And if that's a, a metric that down the road, there's a financial incentive for us to, to select for, um, we're, we're gonna be in good shape with a, a more efficient cow in a lot of different ways. So with all of that, and, and I'm, I guess I'm still a relatively new extension person, and usually the, the big, uh, I guess the big finish, the, the silver bullet solutions usually don't come to the last slide, but I'm gonna do this early, and I'm gonna tell you um, in, in one word the easiest way to improve all of these cow efficiency traits, all these traits that I just showed you, um, the easiest way to do this. Does anybody have a guess? Genet don't have cattle, no, that's not right. Not up in this room, not in this room. No, the, the easiest way to improve every efficiency trait that I just talked about is to crossbreed. And, and this is something that we've known about for a really, really long time, but I think is really underutilized, especially um, in our, our states here. I see a lot of, of straight bred um, commercial herds in the state of Tennessee that's leaving money on the table by not crossbreeding. And so with crossbreeding, there's, there's two big pieces to this that are beneficial um, from an efficiency standpoint. The first is this idea of breed complementarity. So we can take strengths from two breeds and match them together, right? We can take the, the lean growth of a Charolais, we can take the fertility maybe from a Red Angus, um, we can cross those together and, and sort of match those things up in a, um, in a favorable way for us, right? Maybe we need some environmental adaptation. So I know that there are places in the state of Tennessee that could use a touch of Boss Indicus influence in their cow herds, right? So we can take these strengths from breeds and piece them together. And then on top of all this, we get this heterosis, right? And heterosis is our superior performance of crossbred offspring compared to their parents, right? And I'll, I'll have some visualizations of this on the next slide. Um, this is a complex mechanism. My lab studies heterosis in, in some biological depth, but the, the results we've known about for a really, really long time. It just works. And so the people that know about, about heterosis better than, than anybody are the corn breeders, right? My wife works for a, a plant breeding operation now. All that we're planting out in our fields, right, is hybrid corn, right? And, and this hybrid corn is a perfect example of what heterosis looks like in practice, where we're taking each of these little inbred parents, so these wimpy, puny little inbred parents, we cross them together, and we see this amazing outperformance of their first generation cross hybrid compared to those two parental lines. And something similar happens in cattle, but to a, a lesser degree. We can't completely inbreed our cattle um, like we can corn. They tried it at some USDA stations back in the, the 30s and 40s, um, and, and bad things happen when you start getting cow, cattle too inbred, right? But we have all of these breeds, we have all of these lines that we've developed for centuries, really, and we cross these animals together. And, and our, our perfect little example here of, of crossbreeding in the beef industry is that Hereford bull on, a, on an Angus cow we get this, this nice little baldy animal. And, and it, I think that this is a, a great example, um, the baldy female into this, this next little slide, where we talk about the traits that respond um, in the biggest way to, to heterosis, right? So the important thing here is that heterosis and heritability, so the, the variation in a trait that's due to genetics, uh, that's this heritability piece, um, these things are inversely related. And this works to our benefit for a lot of these cow efficiency traits because most of the traits that we care about in, in the context of cow efficiency that I showed you a couple slides ago are very lowly heritable. So things like reproduction, health, immune function, longevity, 
These things are somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, 10 to 20-ish, maybe on the very top end percent heritable, right? But the issue is that these things end up being the biggest beneficiaries of crossbreeding, right? And that's where this, this commercial crossbred female is so, so valuable. You can get somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 30% extra performance due to heterosis in this crossbred female, um, right off the top. So this is, um, in my opinion, the easiest way for us not only to, to boost these things that we, we deal with revenue, so um, things like having a live calf and, and that growth rate of the calf, um, wean pounds, uh, you get a five or 10% increase from heterosis, but the biggest ones are on this commercial female. She's gonna live longer, she's gonna have more calves, she's gonna breed back faster, she's gonna be healthier, and, and all of those other pieces sort of fall in behind that. So heterosis, I think, is, is our biggest tool, but less than 50% of US beef herds are utilizing crossbreeding in a, a sort of organized manner. So I think there's a, a lot that we're leaving on the table here um, by not crossbreeding in our industry. This is the, the last true free lunch that we have. If you're not crossbreeding, I, I can't give you a bigger endorsement. Um, th that is gonna be the key to making that really valuable um, crossbred female that's gonna be long-lived um, and make you money down the road. So the next easiest way to improve cow efficiency traits, and I, I maybe heard this in, in the first answers that got shouted out, uh, improving cow efficiency traits really relies on buying the right bull. Um, I talk about this a lot, I just talked about it at the Tennessee Cattlemen's Convention, but this bull buying decision is really, really important, right? If we get this correct, um, we're good. This is a multi-generational investment in our herd when we keep replacement females, and if we nail this, um, this is going to make us more profitable for the long term, because that bull's daughters are going to stay in our herd, and, and so on and so forth. And so, uh, again, this idea that bull selection plays an outsized role in genetic progress, I think is visualized nicely here. Because if, say we've got a one bull herd, right, which is the majority of our herds in Kentucky and Tennessee, our last three bull purchases, the last three bulls that we've gone out and bought, are gonna account for 87.5% on average, um, always averages in the, in the world of genetics, right, of the, of the calf crop genetics that you have. And the reason being, right, an animal is gonna get 50% of their, of their DNA, of their genetic potential from each parent. So that sire of a, of a calf is gonna be 50% of the DNA, and then over here on the dam side, um, this is the last bull that you bought in your herd. So the dam sire, he's going to be half of the dam. So that's another 25%. And then the dam's grandsire is going to be another, 20, or another half of that 25%. So the, the bull purchases that we make in a herd, um, if we've got 30 animals, 87% of that on average is going to come from our last three bull purchases. So getting this right, utilizing the tools that we've got to do bull selection is really, really important towards driving this genetic progress in our cow herds for traits related to, to overall efficiency. And so the, the big kicker and in, in the thing that I think is really exciting about where we're at now and where we're headed is that we're, we have tools that allow us to make this forage-based cow. That's what we're good at in Tennessee and Kentucky is we can grow grass, um, even in years when the rest of the country is really, really hurting. Um, we're in a place that can grow grass, and we can make the cows that fit that environment, that perform on that grass more efficient through genetics, and there's lots of tools out there that I'm gonna talk about today that allow us to advance that in a, in a fairly quick manner. And so again, this is a, a multifaceted problem. We've got all of these different traits um, on this cow. And, and I'll, I'll do a little example here. Uh, this, is, this is taken from Oak Hollow um, up in Smith's Grove. I was just here yesterday um, with Joe driving around looking at cows, looking at bulls. And, and let's say I'm gonna go up to, to Joe's place and I'm gonna, buy, I'm gonna buy a bull, right? And I want this bull to advance the efficiency in this forage-based system of my cow herd, right? I know that he's gonna have a big footprint on, on my cow herd. And I have all of these tools, right? And I'm gonna walk through all the tools. This is straight from the Angus Association's website that we have um, to select that efficient cow. That gives us wean calf pounds. She's gonna stay around for a long time, right? So the, the things that I look at right away, and we've looked at these for a long time, calving ease direct. How easy are the calves gonna come out of that bull? I'm maybe gonna put them on some heifers. I'll look at that. I also look at weaning weight because that's how I get paid, right? That's what's gonna dictate my check at the end of the year. Then we start to move into these traits that matter for this, the efficiency of this commercial cow. We've got a dry matter intake EPD. This is a, a sort of correlated phenotype on, on how much feed that cow would intake. We have a heifer pregnancy measure in Angus, so this is, is how likely this bull's daughters are gonna get pregnant as, as virgin heifers. 
We have calving ease maternal. How easy will they calve? How much will they milk? We have mature size, um, a mature weight and mature height. And then we get down here into management. We want them to be docile because that's a big piece of whether they'll stick around. We have foot and leg EPDs now, so we can select for that. We have uh, an adaptation EPD for, for pulmonary arterial pressure for putting them at elevation. We have a hair shedding EPD that's just come out, and Jared will talk about that next, right? We have all this stuff, and we're thinking about all this stuff, and it gets to be a lot really fast to juggle, right? This is, this is difficult, right? I can't, I can't do all of this in my head. Um, because it's a real challenge, right? There's all these things that we're trying to balance at once, and, but we have to do multi-trait selection, right? It's, it's not an option for us to just focus on this calving ease direct and weaning weight. We've done it for a long time. Um, in Tennessee, for a long time, our agricultural enhancement dollars have focused exclusively on these two traits uh, towards driving cow-calf profitability in our state. My argument is that there's all these other things that we have selection tools for that allow us to make genetic progress, to make that more efficient cow, to make that more efficient and profitable commercial cow herd, but trying to balance all these things at once is, is too much for me, and I look at way more EPDs than I would like to, right? So multi-trait selection is hard for a number of reasons. The first I, I just explained, right? Lots of traits matter. And the issue here is not just that there's lots of things to keep our eyes on, but it's that they matter in different amounts, right? Some of these traits are very, very important. We need to keep in mind that the most important thing in a, a profitability in a commercial cow-calf herd is a long-lived female. That's very, very important. All these other component traits are, are more and less important. We need her to be docile, but maybe not at the expense of, of some of these other things. So these things are, are, they matter in different amounts. And the other kicker is that they, they're correlated, right? Sometimes these correlations work in our favor, sometimes not. So uh, let's say we've done selection for weaning weight for you know, the last five generations, right? 25 years of selection for weaning weight. What has happened to my mature cow size? I'm keeping replacements after all my selection to weaning weight. What's happened to it? It's going up. And what do, what do 18 and 1900 pound cows like to do a lot of? They like to eat, exactly. And, and that's where this starts to be problematic in terms of overall efficiency, overall profitability is that we might be getting a bigger check at the end of the year with these heavy weaning calves, but it's at the expense of those additional feed costs, maybe a reduced stocking rate that we're able to handle because we have these big monster cows that love to do nothing but eat, right? So these trait correlations are really important and they're, they're difficult for us to tease out when we're just staring blankly at a, a sheet of EPDs. And then also this idea that the economy in which we, we operate, that's changing around us, right? Costs don't stay fixed, am I right? This year has been a, a really good example of that. Our costs are different from year to year, right? Um, fertilizer, I don't even want to imagine what fertilizer was this year for y'all, right? These input costs change, that makes some of our traits much more important, right? If we're looking at, at very, very expensive feed costs in the beef industry over the next five years, that's gonna put a lot more emphasis on a trait like feed intake, right? We need to be more conscientious of all these, but this is hard for us to balance again when we're just staring at an EPD sheet. And then finally, there's gonna be some variations in our operations breeding goals, right? Um, there's no one size fits all um, to our operations. Um, if you're selling freezer beef as your main source of income versus selling wean calf pounds, the traits that you're gonna care about are gonna be very, very different, and, and that makes this multi-trait selection piece a, a little bit harder. So the, the lucky thing for us in a, an efficiency context is that we have tools for this, right? Economic selection indexes, I'm sure that, that Dr. Bullock has talked your, your ear off about selection indexes, but I'm gonna do it a little bit more here because I think they're so important in this overall efficiency and the multi-trait selection that it takes to get there. So I always talk about these as EPDs for profit, right? Instead of picking a trait like weaning weight, we're, we're comparing the dollars that we would expect each of these calves to generate in profit between these two sire candidates, right? So, so really, instead of looking at a difference in pounds like we would for an EPD, we're looking at a difference in dollars in this generalized production scheme. The way that we do this, um, and this is my first equation of the day, I made it, I made it almost 25 minutes in before I threw an equation up. But the, the idea of this is that we have all of these different trait predictions, right? Angus is somewhere in the neighborhood of 28, 30 traits that they're reporting now, right? All these trait predictions that we have, um, these are good. We throw genomics into the picture and they get even better, more accurate indicators of an animal's genetic merit for these traits. 
but, but what we do is we work with our, our econ friends, right? And they help us put real world dollar values on each of these traits, right? In a, in a general sense, right? How much is a, an extra, you know, blank of whatever trait worth in real world dollars, right? What's an extra 1% of easy calvers, right? What's an extra dollar of weaning weight worth? What's an extra, you know, um, 1% of heifer pregnancy, right? We work and we put real life w economic values on these things and allows us to weight these traits by their relative importances. Um, so in the context of a, uh, what we would call a maternal index, probably the most relevant for, for folks in Kentucky and Tennessee, we're gonna put very heavy weight on cow longevity traits. We're gonna put heavy weight on, on things like heifer pregnancy, um, mature cow size. But because we're marketing all of our cattle at weaning, um, most of these indexes that are focused on maternal production aren't going to put heavy weights on things like ribeye area, marbling, carcass weight, right? So uh, again, if you're a freezer beef person, then maybe you're looking at a more terminal index that's going to more heavily weight those carcass and growth traits. Um, if you're not worried about replacement females, there's not a whole lot of, of reason for you to be putting a bunch of weight on things like heifer pregnancy. But we put our economic weights on each of these, we add them up, we account for these genetic correlations. So I said that that's a, an issue, right, when we're selecting for, for growth. Mature cow size goes up, mature cow size goes up. Um, our, our maintenance requirements for that cow go up, right? But we're able to handle with these correlations um, alongside all of these economic weights. And what we're left with is this EPD for profit, right? How much more would we expect to make out of the calves of this bull compared to the calves of that bull? and a really easy and straightforward way for us um, to go out and make selection decisions on multiple traits that are focused on, on the trait that should matter the most to us, uh, which is profitability. And again, along with profitability comes efficiency, and along with efficiency comes sustainability. And so uh, again, I really just want to emphasize that, that even though sometimes it seems like we're um, we're shooting from the hip on these bull decisions. There are a lot of tools out here that directly relate to the efficiency of that bull's daughters, right? And, and we're, we're equipped with these. More of these are coming online. But the most straightforward way to do this is to look towards our economic selection indexes. They allow us to, to drag all of these things along um, with one selection decision. They simplify our, our search space, right? We're not looking at 30 values. Instead, we're looking at one and then trying to tease out maybe the other pieces um, of these EPDs that are important to our herds. Um, but for, for Angus, right, dollar M is, is the, the important piece here. And I'll, I'll, throw, I'll throw this out and, and I'll show you one other index that I'll, I'll talk about before we, we sort of switch gears. But the importance of cow longevity, I think, is illustrated really nicely in the Red Angus Association's Herd Builder Index. This is a, a maternal index, and what you'll see here is this is a pie slice that shows the, the relative weightings of each of these traits. And so for this big green chunk is, it was what Red Angus calls stability. And this is a, a direct measure of how long a cow is going to stick around in a herd. Um, is she going to reach that profitable age where she starts making us money instead of losing us money, right? The next piece is, is mature weight. Um, there's calving ease maternal over here in orange. It's maybe our next biggest heifer pregnancy in blue. And you'll see that well over 75% of this index is focused on those cow traits, right? Because we figured out that selection for these traits is ultimately what's gonna make us more profitable. There's a little bit of weight on, on weaning weight down here, so we're, we're placing some selection pressure to make sure we don't slip there. But what we understand is that the greatest potential for us to be more profitable as commercial cow-calf herds is to make that, that cow base that we have better through bringing um, more maternally oriented um, and stronger bulls into our herds. I'll skip over that um, at the expense of time. And, and throw one more thing out before I switch gears here, and, and that's that it's important to know what's in an index before you start using it. So this is, this is pulled straight from the American Angus Association's website, and um, people that have been around the industry for a while probably remember when the first of, of all of these Angus indexes comes online, and that's dollar B or dollar beef. And I think that we went gangbusters in the Angus industry um, going after dollar beef, right? We're selecting for dollar B because it's new and because it's shiny, but the issue is that in this part of the world especially, when our seed stock producers are selecting for dollar B after dollar B after dollar B, what are they putting selection pressure on? Where are they improving in their herd? And we'll come over here and we'll look and see what's in this dollar B column. Post weaning gain, dry matter intake, carcass weight, ribeye area, marbling, fat. And for, for our producers, right, that are selling wean calves and keeping replacement females, how much selection pressure are we putting on all of these cow efficiency traits that I just showed you on the last slide? 
None, right? And, and so this is a, a really important thing to keep in mind as we start to utilize these indexes, knowing what's underneath the surface here, right? Knowing what's going into these indexes and how it advances our, our breeding goals is really, really important. So again, Angus corrects this, right? And they come out with a number of different indexes, um, the most appropriate for the vast majority of our operations here being dollar M, where you're, you're putting some pressure, again, on all of these traits that we've just said matter for that overall forage-based efficient cow. Oh, and I have this nice little square peg into a round hole. We need to avoid doing that in the industry as, as absolutely much as we can. And so the, the last thing that I'll sort of talk about, and I think that, that Jared's talk that happens right after mine will do a great job of, of describing um, what happens when we go out and we say, hey, we found a trait that's going to help us out, right? Um, how do we go out and turn that into a genomic prediction? I think that he has a, a great example of that with a trait that's very, very important here in the fescue belt. But my argument is that if we can measure a trait, we can make genetic predictions, right? If we can measure enough of these things on animals that live in shared environments that are, are connected to each other through a pedigree or through genomics, we can make these predictions. And with these predictions, we can accelerate genetic progress. Um, there's lots of great examples of, of when a, a trait gets an EPD, um, the genetic trajectory of that trait goes from flat to you know, a pretty substantial angle pretty quick as we look over time. So, so this is where we're looking at now, right? We've, we've done a lot in, in the animal breeding world of refining how we calculate these predictions, but I think the most exciting stuff that's coming down the line is how can we measure and identify new and novel traits that allow us to, to more directly quantify these efficient cows. And, and just another piece here from, from Mike Coffey, who, who's over in Scotland that I, I know well. Mike always says that in the age of genotyping, phenotype is king. And to me, that's very, very true. We've gone from doing basically zero genotyping in um, you know, the early 2010s to Angus is, is adding 150,000 to 200,000 new genomic tests into their database every year, right? Genomics is no longer the problem. The currency that's really, really important and the thing that we have to deal with, I think, from a, an animal breeding and a seed stock perspective is how do we capture these phenotypes that are important and turn them into genetic predictions? The issue is that some phenotypes are harder to measure than others, right? I call this the beef industry's phenotyping paradox. And this is not linear, right? The difficulty or expense in measuring a phenotype um, and then the number of phenotypes that flow into these genetic evaluations. Birth weight, weaning weight, we're very good at, at weighing cattle once, right? Um, this, is, this is pretty easy. Your barrier to entry to capturing a birth weight is a, a hand scale and a little bit of bravery to go out and pick the calf up. That's it. Weaning weight, it's a little bit more expensive. You've got to have a platform scale, right? But the, our ability to measure these things is, is fairly easy. Therefore, we've got lots of phenotypes. Our predictions for these are very good. They have been for a long time. Then we start to move into traits where we have to have some sort of a traceability maybe to, to follow this animal through the production chain um, to get a carcass phenotype. Feed efficiency is another one. We've, we've started in a big way to measure feed efficiency, um, but the investment in these bunks that allow us to directly quantify feed intake, they're expensive, not everybody has them. We're still very short on records of these in, in genetic evaluations. The quality of these predictions will go up as we add more of these. But then we start to move into the things that are, are truly hard or impossible to measure at this point. Um, the big one is disease, right? BRD is something that our, our feedlot contemporaries would love for us to get a handle on. If you're a stalker producer, right, um, knowing if animals are genetically predisposed to a disease would be awesome. If we can, make, if we can measure this trait, um, identify subclinical disease, right? If we could identify um, or just allow that to feed into a genetic prediction equation, right, then maybe we can get a handle on disease tolerance, but that's a really, really hard one for us to handle. Greenhouse gas emissions, I think that there's going to be pressure on us to improve that in the future. Direct measures of an animal's metabolism, as we start to think about efficiency, that's something that we'd love to know is how metabolically efficient is this cow. Uh, but again, measuring that is, is not something that's, that's possible for us to do in an easy way now. And then environmental and stress tolerance, another one of those big, big ticket items for us that, we're, um, that we'd love to be able to measure, but the, the price and, and ability to do so on a large scale is just not there at the moment. So the, and the bigger question, the bigger challenge for us, right, is we're, um, I think that, that not being the pig and chicken industry is a good thing, right? We're still extensively raising these animals, right? We are, we're multi-generation family farms that are doing this, right? But the issue when it comes to, to doing all of these measurements of efficiency, 
is that the environment in East Tennessee or East Kentucky or anywhere in our two states is difficult, right? These animals, we're not seeing them every day, twice or three times a day like, uh, like a dairy would, right? We're not having them all in a, a big barn like a, a chicken or pig producer would, right? We're having to measure these phenotypes and quantify efficiency out in this, this extensive environment. And that's really a challenge for us here. Um, it's a challenge for us. This is um, at my wife's place in Central Texas. Um, these, are, these are challenges for us as an industry. How do we quantify what efficiency looks like in all of these different environments under all of these different management schemes? And so I think that there are two big pieces here, right? To, to measuring forage-based cow efficiency, we need to be able to measure it to predict it. We need to be able to predict it to make genetic progress on it, right? So measuring forage-based efficiency is tough. And then identifying animals that are adapted to the environment in which we're asking them to work is the other big challenge that Dr. Decker is, is going to address head on in this ne next talk. But these two pieces work together really, really closely, right? You could have a cow that's very, very efficient in this, in this tall fescue um, country, right? You throw her out into central Texas and, and the proposition changes, right? Or you bring a, a cow from Texas onto hot fescue, a cow from Montana into a heat stressed environment on a hot fescue, and, and this efficiency looks a little bit different. So I think we have to have a handle on both of these things in order to, to make genetic progress and in, in to, to really address this whole issue. And then there's this idea of a, a tug and pull between resource needs and genetic potential that, that I think we run into a lot in our industry, where cows need resources to reach their genetic potential. If you've got an animal that's in the top 1% of the breed for growth, oftentimes that's going to come along with this need for additional resources, right? And we can also have a, a no or low input animal that just doesn't perform at the end of the day, right? So we need animals that fit our environment, that don't sacrifice on this genetic potential. And a lot of that comes to, to managing um, how these animals, how we fit these animals in their environment, which selection decisions we make at the end of the day. And so with this forage-based cow efficiency, this is, um, I'll dive into just a little bit of the, the research direction that my group has taken um, since I got to the University of Tennessee. And ho hopefully you'll have me back in a couple, three years, and we'll be able to share some more complete um, results from all of this. But our, our big picture idea is that we need to complete all of this, this picture, right? We, we have some tools, but how do we actually fully quantify um, how this cow is going to perform in the forage-based environment that we've given her? And so the, the big ticket item here for me, I think, is understanding how the metabolisms of these cows work, right? We're, it's very, very difficult to measure intake on forage. Um, I know that lots of people have tried to do it, um, and there's lots of different ways out there that we can do it, but not at the sort of scale that we need to, right? So getting an underlying idea of how these cows' metabolisms differ, um, so that's sort of maybe the, the textbook uh, definition of efficiency. And then we have to also throw in all these other pieces that factor into how much, this, how much of our forage resources this cow is consuming and how much of that she's passing down to, to wean calf pounds in her offspring, right? So there's some grazing behavior. Um, that's going to be both genetic, right? Some cows graze differently than others. There's going to be some environmental stuff there, right? If a cow is heat stressed, she's not going to be out grazing. Her feed intake is going to be lower, so on and so forth. Um, there are seasonal differences, obviously, in, in regional variations in forage quality. We were talking about the fescue curve last night at dinner, and that's a, a real challenge for us, right? How do we account for that and a cow's ability to go out and, and consume forage in those more stressful environments and times of the year? Weather and climate falls into this, and, and Dr. Decker will talk about this in, um, in some detail, right? This is a big piece um, of this overall fit and efficiency on a, in a forage-based system, and then also layering in greenhouse gas emissions. I, I think that this is a, a challenge for us moving forward that we're going to have to address head-on with genetics, right? The, the pressure to be more efficient overall is also going to go hand-in-hand with how much we emit, um, and I think there's some, some work to be done in demonstrating that, hey, cows are not the problem here, right? But also, cows have the potential to get better, right? That's the beauty of what we do in cattle breeding is we're working with these organisms that we can improve over time. And, and I think that all these things can work in concert as we, as we move these populations forward. So it, my idea here is that can we identify novel measures of cow efficiency and enable genetic selection down the road? 
the way that we're doing this is with a bunch of different precision livestock farming technologies. Uh, we have a big and active group working in this space at the University of Tennessee across poultry and, and cattle chiefly. Um, but the idea that we can combine things like activity sensors, stick a little Fitbit in a cow's ear, and you can get an idea of, of what her movement patterns look like, how when stressors happen, she responds to those in a, in a behavioral manner. Um, we, can, we can measure things. I'm sure that, that Jared will talk a little bit about their work with, with some camera and imaging systems that they're doing. Um, you know, precision delivery of tailored management strategies. So this is something we're excited about. If we can figure out an animal's genetic potential, can we deliver tailored solutions to them? Um, this is a, a super smart feeder that we have on one of our research stations that based on an animal's EID tag can drop a, a particular one of four different rations to an animal in a specified quantity, right? So if we need an animal at a certain point in time that this sensor has told me that this animal is, it needs an extra little boost to something, um, we can tailor those management strategies to an animal's distinct needs. And then the, the device that I'll talk about there in the corner is a green feed pasture system that we're really excited about. Um, we've got one of these online that's been generating data for like a month and a, a couple more of them on the way that we're, we're really excited about in the context of, of measuring cow efficiency. So the way that this device works, and, and this is out at our, our Middle Tennessee Research Station, um, the cow, this is um, this little red baldy cow, she is like a power user of this thing. Um, she stands there and waits for, for her time to be up. She goes in, it reads her EID tag in this little box. Um, as soon as it's read that EID tag, it's like, hey, you've been here less than eight times today, drops her a little feed treat. She stays in there and eats her feed treat. As she does, it pulls her breath up through this little tube shoots lasers at it, that's the best I can understand as I'm not an, an ag engineer, um, and measures these three gases, right? Carbon dioxide, oxygen, and methane of this cow at that time during that particular visit to the green feed. It's solar powered, beams things up to the cloud. I sit in my, my comfy office chair in Knoxville and, and pull these results down in real time. Um, a really exciting technology for us, uh, again, is we're able to monitor these cows in their natural environment. We're not sticking them in a, um, in a respiration chamber in, in this sort of super controlled environment. She's out doing her work. We're seeing her multi multiple times a day and understanding how these three gases change. Um, we see that there's variation, right? As a geneticist, this is important. We need to have variation in a phenotype to make any sort of selection on it. Um, we know that, that methane emissions are you know, moderately heritable. Um, this is all encouraging stuff. But for me, the more exciting piece of this is that we can take these things. Um, some growth physiologists have done some cool work back in the, you know, the 70s and 90s and then even into the 2000s um, that allow us to take these gas fluxes of an animal and turn that into a metabolic rate. So all of a sudden, we can directly measure the metabolism um, or, or in sort of a, a correlated, as, as best we can, we can measure the metabolism of this animal. And we see lots of variation across these cows that have been on the green feed in their heat production. Um, and this is measured in, in basically calories per day of heat production of these cows. And the really interesting thing to me here is that heat production um, in this paper in 2008, they say accounts for 73% of residual feed intake in a feedlot setting. So all of a sudden what we found here is that maybe this is, gives us the ability to go out and measure an indicator, not a perfect indicator of feed intake, but a good indicator of feed take on a cow in the pasture, in her natural setting, out in her working clothes. And that's really exciting for us. Um, some, some interesting stuff here. I know that I'm coming right up on my time and I, I want to leave some time for questions. Um, but really interesting just to watch is forage quality has declined, forage abundance has declined, and intake has gone down since October 1. We see this, this significant decrease in both the, the metabolic rate, the heat productions of these cows, as well as the amount of methane that they're emitting, right? And that's good for us to know that, that cows with lower intakes um, are going to be lower emitters of methane. And the real kicker here is we want to find these animals that are down here that produce less heat, they produce less methane, um, but the only useful thing for us to do eventually is to overlay calf performance, right? It's good to have a cow that maybe has lower intake or a lower metabolic rate, but if her calf isn't performing, um, that's, a, that's an expense for us as we're, we're not able to generate that stream of revenue in the same way. But, but again, this is all very preliminary stuff that I pulled a, a week or so ago um, that we're just starting to dig through, but that we're very, very excited about in seeing if we can uh, develop some of these novel measures of cow efficiency. 
just recently had a, a project funded that's, that's gonna dive into all sorts of things um, from precision phenotyping to activity. And then I'm a geneticist, so overlaying all of these other pieces of genetics from gene expression to the microbiome that lives in an animal's rumen and, and processes those spores that it intakes. Um, and then eventually tying all of these pieces back to genotypes and allowing us to do genetic selection for overall cow efficiency. And so with that, I'll leave you with some takeaways with my contact information, and I'm, I'm happy to take some questions as they, they switch slides over, and I look forward to the, the Q&A at the end of things here. So thanks again to everybody for having me. I'm, I'm tickled to be in the state of Kentucky today, um, and I'll be sticking around for the next day or two if, if you want to come up and chat about some of this in more detail. So thanks, thanks to you guys for all that. Yeah, I appreciate your hand for this morning for Troy. And uh, he will take just a few questions now if you'd like to, to ask something. I know he's probably challenged your thinking with some of the advanced research that, he's, that they're doing at the University of Tennessee, but we sure welcome some questions. Yes, sir. Wouldn't we be better concentrating our energy on educating the public and especially politicians that the fact that emissions from cattle is less than 3%? If they want to control emissions, they need to be concentrating on transportation and industry and generates electricity, we're spending a lot of time and money trying to measure this when we might be better off spending our time and energy educating them with the facts instead of them promoting that cow farts are killing us right. when actually cows very, very rarely fart. And the methane, of course, is coming from the other end. We let a lot of um, misinformation dominate what we're doing when maybe the correct information would make us more efficient. Right, that's a, that's a great question. He, he basically asked, um, I, I was told to, to repeat questions here, uh, why are we barking up the wrong tree with, with methane research in cattle here? And, and my take there is, is that I 110% agree with you on that. Um, but the important thing for us to do as an industry though, is we've gotta have, we've gotta have hard measures of all this stuff um, to go out and fight that battle though, right? In order to, in order to argue that cattle are, are lower emitters and, and a lot of the evidence that I've seen, we are, we're net, um, we're net negative in carbon emissions, right? We're fixing more carbon than we're emitting as, as cow-calf operations when we take into account what that stuff that the cows eat does, right? So I think it's really important for us to quantify this stuff and also show that, hey, if you're going to put pressure on everybody, right, we're, we, we're a tiny slice, you're going to put pressure on us, we have the potential to improve in the way that a lot of other industries just don't, right? Um, a, a, coal file, uh, a coal plant, uh, a fossil fuel car, right? The, the ability to, to increase the efficiency of those things is something that they talk about all the time. We can talk about the exact same thing in the context of a beef animal, even though we're this, this tiny little sliver. So I think it's, it's half you know, demonstrating that we can improve. And, and honestly, I, I just mentioned this last night to somebody, but I, I think that if you put together an aggregate um, methane index, if the only thing you cared about was methane emissions from a cow, the trait that you would select the hardest on that I talked about today isn't that direct methane emission of the cow, it's probably longevity of a cow, right? If that cow doesn't breed, uh, we talk a lot about um, sort of methane intensity, right? Emissions intensity or emissions efficiency. How much does an animal emit compared with what they produce, right? When your, your calf pounds is zero, right? No matter if you're the most methane efficient cow on the planet, you're, you're gonna be emitting way more per pound of beef that you produce um, than, than another cow who maybe has a slightly higher emission but, but doesn't get bred, right? So I think that, again, these, these issues all sort of are tied together. Uh, the big thing being if we're more efficient, we're more profitable. If we're more efficient, we're, we're more sustainable. And I think having hard numbers to tie to that is, is really, really important. But that's a, that's a great question and, and one that I ask all the time. Uh, Troy, say, say average farmer Bob watched your presentation today and he said, you know what, I'm going to take my Hereford cows, I'm going to get a high dollar M Angus bull, I'm going to crossbreed them. Yep. When it comes to the actual application, you and I touched on this yesterday though, very few commercial producers are doing 100% heifer retention. Right. So aside from a, a genomic test, commercial genomic test on those calves, what would you look at when it comes to heifer retention on which heifers to keep? We, we talked yesterday, hey, those belly draggers might not be the best, most maternal cows anymore. You're probably seeing that with the methane data. And then on the, on the flip side, those cows with longevity, you're giving up genetic progress, but those cows uh, out of heifers, we right. don't necessarily know that they're going to have the same longevity. So what would be your baseline performance testing for heifer retention in a commercial herd? Yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome question, Joe, and, and I probably don't have the perfect answer for that. We could talk about, about commercial genomic tests allowing you to identify those heifers a little bit better. 
Um, but ultimately, I think that that the best that we can that we can do there is is trying to, uh, again, I, I'm just not convinced that we can put strong enough selection pressure on the heifer herd um, in order to, to make an appreciable amount of genetic progress aside from, from those sires that we're bringing in, right? That's where we're gonna drive most of that. And, and I've talked with Dr. Jones about this in, in, some, in some detail as well. In Kentucky and Tennessee, a lot of times, we should be purchasing replacement heifers um, in a lot of cases, right? That's a really quick way for us to, to give a little jolt to the, the genetic potential of our cow herd. If we're purchasing replacements, it also opens up some, some new doors in a crossbreeding uh, cross context, right? We're able to bring in a true terminal cross onto those purchased genetic heifers and make genetic progress a little bit faster on both the sire and maternal lines there. So, not, again, not a perfect answer to your question, but um, that's, a, that's a tricky one, right? I think that my, my econ colleagues would say that cow longevity, even in a commercial herd particularly, um, outweighs the, the sort of cost of, of slower generation interval and in, in genetic progress. Okay, so, so he just asked, uh, he's got a commercial herd with Angus, he's made some baldies. Um, I, I'm a very biased uh, recovering Charlet breeder, so I would say that um, bringing a big, a big white terminal cross in there, but, but again, that's, that's all gonna be, uh, I'm gonna do my extension specialist thing here and say that it depends. Um, it depends on what your end goal is, right? Are you, are you mar how you're marketing those cattle, um, what sort of premiums you get for, for having, say, a black-eyed calf, how you market your animals, right? Do you retain ownership? All those pieces will sort of change what that answer would be. But um, there's, there's a lot of options out there to bring a third breed in, um, get the, the heterosis good out of that crossbred female and, and keep it going with a, a third breed in the mix. So we can, we can talk more. Right, uh, a really good question there. 30, 30 head herds, right? These are, these are one bull herds. This is Kentucky, this is Tennessee, this is Missouri uh, in a large way, right? What's the best way for us to, to handle this and, and get a jump start? And like I said, the, the bull purchase, both from a, a breed decision, right? Getting the, the advantage of crossbreeding there, um, and also identifying bulls that, that are you know, genetically targeted towards our production, um, our production goals is really important. Uh, I think that, that some folks can, can make artificial insemination work um, and keep the bull off the farm, right? My, my dad was a big proponent. We, we had a, a smallish herd, right? If he didn't have a bull on the farm, he was a happy guy. He liked to have him frozen in a, in a semen tank. But, but I also think that, that that's not practical for, for every operation either, right? Um, it also, you know, I think there's the potential, particularly in Kentucky and Tennessee, at a really affordable price to go out and get a bull that has the genetic potential of a lot of the AI sires um, and, and have them on your farm and, and own that asset. But at the same time, m maybe your operation isn't set up to keep a bull for, for the you know, 300 days of the year that he's, he's not out working. So uh, that's a, another it depends question, I think, but a, a good one, lots of different ways to, to skin the proverbial cat. We can take other questions of that nature at the end. Let's have one more nice round of applause for Troy. Excellent job, Troy. We really appreciate that.